breaking demonic strongholds. The battle many times when you get delivered or when you get healed or on the way to deliverance and healing is in the mind. One of the testimonies I heard, one of the most powerful testimonies I've heard in my life, it didn't happen in our ministry, but I, I've heard of this testimony. It's a, it's a young girl who had an injury to her brain. She was taking, they were taking a photo of her when she was sitting on a horse. And the horse got spooked by the flash from the camera, kicked her out, and she fell. As a young girl, she had a, a brain damage. Because of that, she developed seizures, grammar seizures. So every few days she would have seizures and then they intensified. She couldn't go to school at like normal students. They would call her little seizures. And so they had to pull her out from school. And then at the particular age, the doctor decided to do a surgery on her brain. The surgery went really bad and it actually intensified her seizures and it didn't make things better. It made things worse. One day she's watching television and on the television, a, a pastor is looking through the screen and gives a word of knowledge and says, I see a horse, an injury to the brain due to something with the horse and God is healing you. So she listens to the word and she just receives it, you know, as from God, claims the healing, didn't feel anything different, but received it. And from that point on, for the next month, for the first time in all of her known life, she doesn't have seizures. God supernaturally heals her. Now, 30 days later, she's in the kitchen and she gets a seizure. As she is on the floor having a seizure, in her mind there's a battle. The first thought says, I knew it, that God didn't heal me. The other thought that said, God did, and I disagree with this seizure. I remember hearing her testimony, and this is what struck me. And she said, and in my mind, I chose to believe I was healed. I didn't deny the presence of this seizure. I refused its place of influence. I didn't deny its presence. I rejected its influence. She says, I got up from that seizure. Instead of saying, I need to be healed again, I said, this is not my portion. I was healed. I don't know what this was, but this is not who I am. That was the last seizure she had for the next 14 years and never had it again. A lot of times people get healed and you go back home and the symptoms come back or you get delivered and the same demons that were on the inside now are on the outside lying to you that they are on the inside. Because when they are on the inside, they never tell you that they are on the inside. But when they are on the outside, they tell you that they are on the inside. And so it messes with people and sometimes they're like, what do I do? And people say, man, I need to go back for the deliverance. But you must understand that there is a mental strongholds that need to be broken when you get delivered and when you get healed because the devil wants to make your issue your identity. He wants you to go back to Egypt the moment you see Pharaoh behind you for another deliverance when sometimes you gotta go forward through the Red Sea and trust that God will drown that old Pharaoh in the Red Sea and the enemy whom you see today you shall see again no more. Somebody say break the stronghold. In the Bible the word stronghold appears actually only once. The concept is all over the Bible, but the word is mentioned only once. And I'm going to read to you the famous verse that we all know, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now let me give you just a context of this. In the context, pulling down strongholds refers to demolishing walls, walls of resistance in people's minds, particularly how rebellious Corinthians 
were thinking about Paul and the nature of his apostleship. That's why you see in the Corinthian letter, Paul keeps defending his apostleships to this group of people. So he's talking about demolishing worlds, walls of resistance in their minds. A stronghold, if you're taking notes, is a fortress of lies that the enemy builds in our mind and emotions. It's a place of arrest, captivity, confinement, detention, imprisonment, or incarceration in your thinking that prevents you from experiencing all God has for you. Now interesting that overlooking ancient Corinth, there was a hill of 1,857 feet high. On the top of that was a fortress. So Paul uses the imagery of illustration of a spiritual warfare. He destroyed strongholds, cast down towers, and two captives. So there was a hill, there was a fortress on the top of the hill, and sometimes in that fortress they kept captives there. So Paul is talking to Corinthians using the imagery that they're actually from their own backyard. A fortress, a captives inside of the fortress on the hill. He says, we're coming up to those high places and we're bringing down those strongholds and we are releasing and taking captives now for obedience to Christ. If you're taking notes, write down point number one. Strong man lives in a stronghold. A strong man, a demon, lives in a stronghold. House of thoughts. Matthew 12, 29, it says, how can one enter a strong man's house? Have you noticed that a strong man has a house? How can somebody enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first binds the strong man? Let's go over quickly on the difference between open doors and strong men. So we're just going to lay a foundation for this understanding. An open door is how the demons get in. Strongholds is how they stay. An open door, really there's three main open doors to demons. There is the inherited things, there is the things that are involved, and last year I talked about it, and then there's the things that are called intrusion. So inherited things are the things that where demons come through the blood, bloodline. The involvement is when you're involved in things that open doors to demons. And intrusion is when demons intrude, usually through an abuse or through a violation. Somebody violates you and demons can use that as an opening. Think of an open door as your front door. An open door to demons is an opening. How demons stay, how many you know those of you who come, you, let's say you have a renter that lives in your house, they don't live in the front door. They get through the front door, but they usually have a room that they stay in. So the same way demons operate, demons get through an open door, they don't stay through an open door. What causes them to stay is usually a place, a room, and the Bible calls that a stronghold. They get a stronghold in our mind, in our emotions. And we mentioned few types of strongholds. So the common strongholds are fear, anger, rejection, depression, abuse, and self-hatred. The common strongholds are fear, write this down, anger, rejection, depression, abuse, and self-hatred. How demons get in is not how they stay. They get in through an open door, but they stay because of a stronghold. What gives them a place to stay is a stronghold. And that's one of the reasons if all we do is lock the door, but we do not remove their room, we can live in perpetual torment without having a demon. Think of Israel. Illustration. Israel came out of Egypt. Read their journey to the promised land. They were always in pain and suffering. It wasn't that God was causing that pain. Oh, it was wilderness. No, the two men, Caleb and Joshua, didn't have the same attitude. Because you can take somebody out of a ghetto, taking a ghetto out of them are two different things. You, excuse me, you can take somebody out of Egypt, taking Egypt out of them are sec completely different. See, what the enemy is interested in is to build within you and I a stronghold. So when he leaves, you're still suffering. That the, the stronghold 
continues to torment you and it gives him a place to stay anytime you slip up and give an opening again. The strongholds demolishing them is very important. That's why the Bible says do not give a devil a foothold. Now some of us we use that usually as an opening. Now one translation says an opportunity. But that word there, a foothold, uses, it's a Greek word for topos, which means a specific marked off geographical location. It carries the idea of a territory, province, region, zone, or geographical position. It deals more than with an open door. It deals with, because see, we can all sometimes potentially, for example, when you come in and out of the house, the door stays open. This doesn't mean that a fly gets in. Sometimes people, you know, say that if, if you do all of these sins, this is how the demons will always get in. It's not always the case because you can meet people who did exactly those things and the demons didn't get in. Why? Few reasons. How you grow up, your upbringing, an emotional fortress your parents build by building your self-esteem as a child plays a big role to repel demons down the road. Demons do not violate somebody's will. That's why some even unbelievers can commit a certain sin and you absolutely don't see a demon getting in. You see the other person who does exactly the sin and boom, they got a demon. One person can watch a porn, repent, no problem. The other person watches porn one time, like it happened with me, and something comes in. And I remember I asked this person who has done over, I think 60,000 deliverances one on one, and I said, why is that, that a one person can do this sin and get a demon, the other person does exactly the same sin, and they don't seem to get a demon, at least there is no manifestation. I said, is it true, or maybe the demon is hiding? And he used the example that really uh, touched me. He says, think of immune system. One person can come in contact with germs and quickly get sick. The other person can come in contact with the same germs and not get sick. Because of the immune system that the person has. That's why parents, when you raise your children and you train them in the ways of God, if they ever get contaminated with certain things, an accident or come in contact, that doesn't always mean that, oh, they'll be exposed to demons. Actually, there's a spiritual immune system that's built. It doesn't give an excuse to sin, but it protects them. When you praise God, when you read the scriptures, when you fast, you're building a spiritual immune system. That if sometimes you slip, trip, fall, and touch something that is not right, see something that is not right, you repent. You ask the blood of Jesus Christ to wash you, and you keep walking with the Lord. Why is that? Because you have a spiritual immune system. This doesn't give you a license to sin. It just gives you power to walk with God, not fear demons. Come on, somebody. So the Bible says, do not give a foothold, do not give the devil a room as part of a stronghold where he begins to occupy that in your mind. An open door is how demons get in, but a stronghold is how demons stay in. Demons are cast out, but strongholds, as we've read, are cast down. So demons out strongholds down. Now let me give an example. Let's say you have a rental property and it has some bad renters living there. And on top of that, not only this rental property has really bad renters living there, but underground you found out there's some toxins that cause this property to be complete and needs to be completely demolished. There's two things you need to do. Number one is you have to evict the renters. It does not destroy the house. You can get the renters out and the house still stands. You evict the renters and then you bring down the house. So demons out, strongholds down. Now, how many of you know it's easier to evict people than to demolish a house? Now, of course, and I mean respectfully, when I'm not talking about evicting people for no reason or any, anything like that. But it's easier to bring somebody out of the house than it is to bring the house down. To demolish a house takes a lot of time. To get somebody out of the house is not very difficult. They pack the bags and they leave. The way I exited the hotel room today was very quick. For them to bring that hotel down will take a long time. Because buildings are built slowly. 
and brought down slowly. But people come in quickly and can get out quickly. Demons come in usually quickly and demons usually get out quickly. But when it comes to bringing down strongholds, it's not an easy process, which is why it gets frustrating and very painful at times with something I'm going to deal with right now. Number two, the devil wants to destroy your life, but he actually also wants to build your mindset. Something that we don't realize, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, John chapter 10, verse 10. While he's killing, stealing, and destroying, he's also building something. He's building, I, I like to say like this, the devil uses moments to build mindsets. He will sometimes even use what is true to build a stronghold. Jesus uses the truth to break down the stronghold. It is true that maybe you have a cancer in your body, but the truth fights what is true, subdues what is real and visible to our eyes. And it's higher than the facts and the physical realm that we live in. I used this, I think, example last time that I, that I was here and I mentioned about a, um, a fish. They did a study on a barracuda fish and barracuda fish is not born again. It eats other fish for living. Prey and predator uh, stuff exists in the barracuda fish world. They put a barracuda fish into a fish tank and they put other small fish and of course barracuda fish, thank God for lunch and went <laughs> and the little fish were gone. Then what they did is they put a glass in the fish tank and they put the other fish on the other side of the glass and of course barracuda fish saw the lunch and went straight for lunch. Pow! Hit the glass. The next time, remembering the fact that there's a glass, um, she hit the glass slower. A third time, even slower. And after a few days, Barracuda learned a lesson. You don't go to the other side. And then they removed the glass. And Barracuda fish never went to the other side. Why? Because when you fail so many times, while you're being defeated, you're also being built. What are you being building? Failure. Don't try again. Fear is being built. So in one way that the enemy is destroying, and while you're now realizing he's not only destroying, he's building something. Fear. Anger. Depression. In one way he's destroying our life, in the other way he is building our life. They did a study one time, um, um, they took five millionaires and they took five homeless people and they decided to do a study for a few years and swap them. So they put the millionaires in a homelessness position and they gave each homeless person one million dollars. I think it was five people that they did a study on. Within about a few years, most of the homeless people who received a million dollars, not only they went back to being homeless, some almost committed suicide. All the five millionaires, when they went actually on the streets, they had one rule. They could not do a business they did before. And number two, they could not reach out to their known contacts. Within five years, most of them were millionaires. Few of them were not millionaires. But everybody was out of the streets within about a few weeks. And this is their conclusion. They came to this conclusion. Being a millionaire is not a financial status. It's a state of mind. Something that might offend you right now as well. Being homeless is also has very little to do with money. It has a lot to do. I didn't say all of it. A lot to do with your mindset. That's one of the reasons people who win lotteries usually don't stay rich. That's why usually people who are successful basketball players and you see within a short period they're losing their money. That's why Shaquille O'Neal when he received his one million dollars and he spent all of that in 30 minutes. And his financial advisor called him and he says, oh great, you're on the way to be a statistic like all of your other predecessors. And instead Shaquille O'Neal went to school and got his master's and then got his PhD in finance and today he's a multi-multi-millionaire. Not because he's a great basketball player, but because he understood that something happens when your mind changes. It almost like it becomes a magnet for the very thing that your mind is full with. 
And the Bible's been telling us this for a long time. That's why the Bible says Romans chapter 12 verse 2, what do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. But most of us still really believe in our subconscious level that you will really renew your mind when God changes your life. And we tell God, you heal me and then I'll think positive thoughts. You bless me and then I'll be happy. God give me a husband and then I will not be lonely. God says it's other way around. The devil has used your situation to build inside of your stronghold. But today the strongholds are coming down. Come on, somebody shout, strongholds are coming down. The Bible uh, uses, I think it's five mindsets. Number one is the right mind, Mark chapter 5, 15. Number two is the sober mind, Titus 1, 8. A sound mind, 2 Timothy 1, 8. Spiritual mind, Romans 8, 6. Anxious mind, Luke 12, 29. Debased mind, Romans 1, 28. And carnal mind, Romans 8, 6. Which tells me that this is not just a thought that wanders in your mind, an anxious thought. When you have an anxious mind, that means the dominant thoughts of your mind are anxiety. When you have a debased mind, meaning the, the dominant thoughts of your mind are twisted. When you have a carnal mind, meaning the dominant thoughts in your mind are carnal. The sound mind, meaning the dominant thoughts of your mind are healthy. So the mind, it doesn't just refer to random thoughts. It refers to the dominant persuasive thoughts that dominate your mind. If you look at this list, which one would you identify yourself with? And I'm not talking about the thoughts you think, but the thoughts that, you know those thoughts that kind of think on their own? It's the stuff you're driving and your mind thinks. Just kind of, you, you, you hear stuff, it's your subconscious mind. It just kind of speaks to you. It kind of does this, it's the aromatic responses. It's those things that are strongholds that God wants to break and build healthy strongholds. That we do have a stronghold of faith, that we have a stronghold of peace, that we have a stronghold of love in Jesus' name. The scripture says, you shall know the truth, John chapter 8, verse 32. And the truth shall make you free. Four verses later, John 8, 36. And if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Write this down. The name of Jesus removes demons, but strongholds are broken by the truth of Jesus. See this, in, in one breath, Jesus said, Whom the Son sets you free is free indeed. It's almost like Jesus is saying, my name drives out demons. But then he says, if you know the truth, you will be the truth will set you free. So I, I don't get it. So is it Jesus setting me free or the truth? Well, it's both. Because if you understand that demons are not the only problem, it's also what they build in people's minds and what breaks those things in our minds is not the name of Jesus as much as it is the truth of Jesus. The Word of God. Now, facts do not break strongholds. Truth breaks strongholds. Buddha said, I'm the seeker of truth. Muhammad said, I'm the prophet of truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. My words are life. My words are truth. Jesus didn't point people to a book. He always pointed them to himself. He never pointed them to principles. He says, follow me. I am the truth. Something happens when you begin to take not only the name of Jesus that expels demons in the power of the Holy Spirit, but the teachings of Jesus, the words of Jesus, the principles of Jesus that have a life inside. I know some of us think, well, it's just a book written thousands of years ago. See, this book says about itself that God breathed. <sighs> the first time God did that to a corpse, it became living soul. Last time Jesus did that to his disciples, they received the Holy Ghost. And then God went into a book and said, 
So when you read it, you inhale the Spirit of God. You inhale the truth of God. You inhale life giving spirit into your life. That's why it comes alive every time you read it. That's why it expands every time you read it. That's why when you memorize it, it cleanses you from sin. Your word I've hidden in my heart that I will not sin against you. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This word is living and powerful, sharper than any to a sword. Something happens when this book filled with the Holy Ghost goes inside of your system, breaks down strongholds breaks down anxiety, breaks down nightmares, breaks down abuse, breaks down rejection, breaks down low self-esteem, breaks down lies, breaks down things people said about you. Layer by layer is being ripped up, brick by brick is coming down. Kanda borobo satarabaketaya. Somebody shout the truth. Doesn't set you free. The knowledge. You can buy a truckload of soap and stink like a skunk. Because soap doesn't make you clean. Applying the soap makes you clean. That's why Jesus didn't say the truth sets you free. He says you will know. The truth you don't know is the truth that cannot help you. You can have it on your bookshelf. How many of you know medicine? Advil doesn't work in the bottle. It only works in your body. The Bible will not work in the Bible. It has to go from the pages to my thoughts, to my words, to my heart. If you buy a five gallons of white paint, the color of your walls in the house do not change. They only change when you apply that paint on every piece of wall you want to see changed. Jesus gives us the truth, but he says, if you don't know it, if you don't apply yourself to it, it cannot help you. I was born and my parents told me that uh, my optical nerve was damaged during the birth. For the next two years I spent in a hospital. In fact, one time they said that I died out of the hospital and my uncle, my pastor, prayed for me and they resuscitated me and brought me back to life. As a teenager, when I grew up, I grew up with a lot of insecurities. I was bullied. I didn't know that was bullying until I came to the United States. I thought that was normal behavior, how you treat deformed children and I felt I was deformed. I felt that I didn't belong. My parents saw that I struggled and they scheduled the first eye surgery in the Ukraine. The surgery was not successful because afterwards, so my problem is that when I look up, one eye chooses to look up, the other one resists. Just look straight. I'll demonstrate it right now. It just doesn't, doesn't obey my instructions. So the doctors tried to fix that. It didn't work afterwards. We come to the States. I'm 13 years of age. I don't speak any English. I don't have really any friends. All of the friends I grew up with were my two neighbors and they're not here anymore. They're there left in Ukraine. My pastor starts a church and the church that he starts is more progressive in the, in a sense of they have worship clapping. I grew up in a very traditional Pentecostal church where no makeup, no earrings, no clapping, no drums and none of this stuff. So my uncle starts a church and we're clapping. Now I was conditioned that clapping is demonic. Drums were like ultra demonic. So I'm experiencing culture shock. I'm experiencing religious shock and I'm going to school where a teacher speaks in a language I do not understand. Because my pastor starts a church, the two other Slavic Russian churches in the community quickly ostracized us. When I say they ostracized us, we were not allowed to shake their hands with their kids in school. So on our bus rides, it was normal for stuff being thrown in my face from my brothers and sisters of my culture to the point I had to leave those buses so that I don't get abused. So my life was really made of that. On the top of that, because my optical nerve was damaged, I extremely grandma headaches every single time my head gets exposed to the sun. I'm 13 and a half. I'm as insecure as they come. I was so shy and scared of people. 
I was actually skipping my freshman year a keyboarding class because I found out and I heard that the teacher said, tomorrow we're all going to get up in front of the class and talk for a minute and 20 seconds about where we grew up. I was so chronically scared of people that I spent that day on the bus station. I was scared of people. I was afraid. I believe in my subconscious that God made a mistake when he created me. He was so busy probably with Middle East and, just, and the Soviet Union and all of this stuff. And I was born and he's like, oops, he's here. What do we do? Let's keep him until he dies and in heaven we'll, we'll fix everything. I, it sounds bad, but that was my theology about me. So when a preacher would get up and say things like God has a plan, it went in one ear, <laughs> went the other one. I had an issue with God sometimes. I didn't voice it out too much. Why did he allow me to be born like that? Did I do anything wrong? Um, did he foresee me doing something wrong? That he wanted to, I don't know, punish me for something? It was very difficult for me. So my prayer at the age of 13 and a half and 14 became this. God caused an accident and take me out of this world. Because it's better with me not in it. I'm a burden to everyone. I don't want to be here. Nobody else wants to be me to be here. I don't belong here. I live with that rejection. Every birthday party I would come, I felt rejected. In fact, what I would do in birthday parties as a teenager is I would come, I would come, I would look at people, and I would run home. And I hated myself for that. Every time I met somebody, the first question they would ask me is this, what happened to you? And I said, what do you mean? With your eyes. To me, it reminded they didn't see me. They didn't ask my name. They asked what happened to me. I was so conscious of my eyes. The fact that they became conscious reminded me, something is wrong with you that can't be fixed. I had second eye surgery at the age of 13 and a half in the United States. It was to lift the lip of my eye so that it would look similar. It didn't work. The doctor scheduled the third surgery and said, we'll try lift it higher, but when you sleep, your eye won't close. I said, yeah, I'll skip on that. Being insecure is one thing. Looks scary for my future wife if I ever get married is totally another. My only place where I thought I could belong was in this new church that my pastor started. It's a charismatic church, you know, like this upbeat church that I disagreed with inside. Didn't feel like I fully belong. But I said, okay, my pastor start picking me up, speaking into me. And there was only one really place you can be involved in this new young church. And it was this young worship team. So my hope was I, I was not good at school. I was not good with people. I, this is one place I'm going to be good at. And this I'm going to join this only place where you could find meaning at the time in our church. That church was very young and that is on the stage. So I joined, I was so excited. I found an ounce of hope until I remember the conversation on Saturday when I was asked to leave this worship team. And these were my cousins that kicked me out. They said, um, we don't know how to tell you, but you're not good. And I said, I understand. Turn off my microphone. Let me be there. They said, your microphone has been off. Oh, um, it's funny now. I wept going from that apartment back home. The last thing I hoped to help me, my whole world failed. I was hoping for an accident. Taking my life was not an option. This is a sin and I don't want to commit that. But if God does it, I've seen my best friend killed in front of me when I was lying on a swing. It was an accident uh, and I saw death. I know that it's quick. And I hoped that mine will be quick as well. I thought I'll never get married. I don't have a meaning. And my life was an accident. Because of headaches and because of deep projections, some bullying, what I did every day is I locked myself in the room for 30 minutes after school, Monday through Friday, it was like a clock. I bumped, I think it was Carmen at the time, bumped Carmen some other uh, music, very loud, because I didn't want my parents to hear. 
and I bawled my eyes out. I, I accused God. I was vulnerable. I was telling him, why did you make me like this? What did I do? Why do I have to suffer with headaches? Why do I have to not belong? Why do I look in the mirror and I'm scared of what I see? I hate myself. I do not like myself. You say I'm fearful and wonderful. Yes, I am fearful. I'm scared of myself. And I would spend the 15 minutes that, and then somehow, you know, like you feel better. And I would end up worshiping the very God I just accused of everything. It was like a little bipolar in prayer. Then I found out David had the same thing in Psalms. You know, it starts with, why, why, why? It says, God, I, my soul praises you. It seems like God wasn't threatened by that. God saw my immaturity. God saw that I was broken. I was hurting. This happened day in, day out, 13, 14, 15. Three years straight, every single day. Then I would read this word. And slowly but surely, I can't explain. I wish it, it would happen in one day. I wish it was one encounter. It did not happen with one encounter. It happened in about the process of three years. It's almost like brick by brick. Something started to change inside of me. You know why Adam felt ashamed and kind of felt ashamed when he was naked, though he had a perfect body because of what he ate. He ate what was forbidden and after that shame came. And I feel like the Holy Spirit started dealing with me and he says, your problem with why you feel this about yourself is because of what you're eating. And what you've been eating is your own view of yourself and everything. And as you started to feed on my word, your diet changes and then changes your feelings. What, ha what started to happen first is this. God supernaturally healed me of my headaches. My headaches just were gone. Secondly, what started to happen is this, is I stopped caring what people think about me and I stopped going to school to get affirmation or approval. I went to school for grades, no longer for friends. My eyes were still the same. Everything else was different. Within about three years, the very worship team that kicked me out, I was its worship leader. Now, I had no idea how they put me back there because my voice did not improve. I don't know what it was. My grades went straight A's in, in school. At 16, I became a youth pastor. The very thing I dreaded is the very thing I do most of the time. And I'm still a very introvert. For those of you, those people who know me, I'm extremely shy. What you see here, that, that's not me. That's just something else. <laughs> you know, I'm very shy. As a person, I'm an introvert. I prefer to be alone and all of that. That part is still stay there. And the Lord uses that to help me spend time in a secret place. And so, but the fear of people is no longer there. An interesting thing, as I'm speaking, most of you are not distracted with my eyes. You know why? Because I'm not conscious of it either. Today, I don't hate myself. I'm not like obsessed with myself, but I don't hate myself. I am married. God has given me purpose. What I'm sharing with you today about strong words is not something I've read in the book. It changed my life. I am a different person today. You shall know the truth. The truth will set you free. God didn't change the skin stretched over my skeleton. But something inside that changed that really matters. And that really is the most important thing. And that is what's happening right here and what's happening right there. Positive thinking couldn't do it. Psychology couldn't do it for me. Therapy counseling couldn't do it for me. What did it for me, and honestly, I'm not against that. That has its place, but the place that I was in, when I was on my knees, and honestly, nobody was there to coach me. But what I love the Holy Spirit for is that, listen, when you are inexperienced and you fall before Him and you lean on this Word, He'll get you out of whatever darkness that you are in. He's going to help you to get out of that depression. He's going to help you to get out of that low self-esteem. He's going to help you to get out of that despair. He's going to help you to get out of that hopelessness. And it will seem like everyone is against you. It will seem like you have no hope you have no future but if you are breathing you have hope God says that it is my will to give you hope and a future and if there is a breath in your nostril that is hope in your soul and that hope is found in Jesus that hope is found in the cross that hope is found in the scriptures you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free Somebody say amen. Number three. Stronghold 
is the devil's work. Destroying it will take time. Be patient. Put in parentheses, be nice to yourself. Demons are cast out quickly, as I mentioned. Strongholds are broken down over time. Think of a stronghold breaking is like Jericho wall coming down. It takes time. Now I want to share to you a, a verse, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this person, the Son of God, was manifested that he might destroy. Somebody say destroy. Destroy the works of the devil. Now the word destroy is the word in, in strong, says G3089. Um, uh, and that's the word for loosen dissolve or put off now i'm going to read you another verse where this word destroy is used watch this luke chapter 3 verse 16 jesus answered saying to all indeed i baptize you with the water but the one john answered i'm sorry but the one that's coming is mightier than i whose sandals i'm not worthy to loose the word loose here is the same word for destroy the works of satan what does loosing sandals have to do with destroying the works of Satan, which are strongholds? I'll demonstrate. Strongholds are like shoelaces. Takes time. Only then you can come out of a shoe. You have to, lace by lace, layer by layer, you have to, how do you tighten them? Is you got to, Pull them in, one by one. That's how the devil puts a tight grip. The way God removes those strongholds, Jesus says, I came to destroy, loosen, loosen straps. And it's when God loosens it, it will take time. When God loosen, when God loosens those straps, over your mind it is a process you don't get it done at the altar you have to have an altar where you do that at every day I wish there was a pill I can take it doesn't happen like that there is no importation for breaking down strongholds there's only a practice of, it takes a process. Next time you're tying your shoelaces, think of strongholds. <laughs> Some of you will never tie your shoelaces the same way after this. You're like, I'm breaking down strongholds. Come on, somebody. I'm coming out of this head first. <laughs> it takes time. It's not immediate. I mentioned yesterday about my wife. That spirit of loneliness, that, that curse, that generational curse of loneliness and, and self-rejection that was there. Interesting that happened uh, with my wife is when we broke that curse. In fact, we were actually in Africa and one pastor prayed for her and said, you are free. This minister that uh, ministered to her and said, you are free. And so we, we left home. You know, she had nightmares. She had really just, 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 just hard things. And I was like, man, that's it. This will never happen. Interesting, prior to this, I didn't mention yesterday, to try to solve my wife's um, not feeling like she belonged in the church, I tried to marry her sister with one of the guys in our church. Her sister lived far from her. She was her best friend. So her sister would visit us, and I would set, set her up on a blind date with somebody from our church, thinking if I can get her married to one of the guys in our church, she moves, my wife's loneliness, not having friends, will be solved. It never worked. Like she hated all the guys that I set her up with, and it's just it just did not work. So I was like, man, this is failing. This is not working. So we go. My wife receives deliverance. You know, we pray for her. She, she didn't manifest, but she felt like it was broken. Interesting. She comes back home, and the nightmares and those attacks did not stop. And so I was like, man, we just need to go find a just a deeper deliverance minister who can maybe just deal with this because I'm like, I, I'm sorry, babe, but I. That's the best that I could do. I'm just going to continue to pray for you, continue to support you. And my wife worked at post office at the time, so she was delivering mail. And one of the things that she was allowed to do is to listen to whatever she wanted to listen as she was sorting mail and then delivering mail. What she started to do is she started to take the teachings on the Holy Spirit and for five to six hours a day for the next year and a half, she would listen to that. 
What started to happen with her is the nightmare subsided. What started to happen after that is that her job, her finances improved. She started to, instead of look for recognition in the church as a first lady or as a pastor's wife, she just found the girls that nobody wanted to hang out, brought them to our house and started a small group with them. This small group multiplied to seven or eight different small groups. <laughs> this is funny. Her sister married my brother or my brother married her sister. I was like, that's, that's a sign from God. The stronghold is completely demolished. So when she no longer needed those outside support, now they came. See, one of the things when you have a stronghold of rejection, you get rejected in every place you go into. And sometimes you think it's because of the places. But my friend, if every place you went to, you got rejected, the common denominator is you. If it's five churches you went to and five churches you had the same experience. Now first one, I agree. Maybe it's them. Second one, perhaps it's them. Maybe third one is them. But the fourth one, I'm sorry. That's you. Because you are the only one that's been in all of those five. And some people carry a stronghold in their life. Everywhere they walk in, it's like a magnet. It attracts the very thing they're filled with. The other person can have an experience in the same environment, totally different. Why? Because what they're filled with, the Bible says what you have, you have more of until you have abundance. If you're filled with that, any area you walk into it, you honestly attract. I don't believe in law of attraction, that's new age. But I do believe something happens when you carry a stronghold. You seem to have everything around you support your thesis. It almost feels like the whole world stinks, but sometimes you just have cheese on your nose. And it's not the world, just remove that. And it's called a stronghold. And I saw my wife in front of me in those few years, but I wish I would say that it was a deliverance that broke. I believe deliverance broke the generational curse. But developing your mind through the scripture broke the stronghold of that generational curse. So that's why I don't want you to go in and to treat deliverance as a hammer and every problem as a nail. And also I do not want you to get discouraged. I got delivered, my life didn't change. Deliverance removes demons, that's all. It doesn't change your mind. It doesn't change your habits. It doesn't change your character. It doesn't change the fact that you don't have a routine of reading the word. It doesn't change the fact that you gossip. It doesn't change the fact that you have always been negative. It only gets the demons part out. But the other parts of you, they still need to be changed by breaking down strongholds. And that happens by applying yourself and the truth you know begins to set you free. Come on somebody, give God some praise. Number four. Your mind does not change when your life gets better. To break down the strongholds, you have to break this lie that if there is a change in my circumstances, it will change my mind. That, that's what I believed. If only my face can change, how I think about myself will be altered. If only people accept me in this place where it seems to be, this is the sign of being involved and I belong and I have a self-esteem. If everyone around me stops asking me what happened to your eye, that I will no longer feel like I don't belong. I wanted everyone to change so that I could eventually change as a result of them, my mind, which means I gave all the control to everyone. That means you are responsible for my mood. You are responsible for my thoughts. The weather is responsible for how I feel. Everyone is, that's a lot of control to a lot of people. A dangerous way to live. Have you, when you read Genesis chapter one, have you noticed that in chapter one, the first thing that God creates on day one was the light. On the day four, he creates the sun. 
Now, I'm a logical person and um, not super complicated, but in my mind or worldview, you don't get the light if you don't get the sun. I don't know, it's simple, but I just, I don't understand how can you get the light if you don't have the sun. I always, when I was younger, I used to tell people on the first day, God created the, the sun because that's where we get the light. And then you read the Bible more carefully, you realize, oh shoot, uh, he didn't actually make the sun on the first day. He made it on the fourth day. You're like, oh, then we have a problem. Because the world I live, you do not get the light if you don't have the sun. The world God lives, you get the light so you can have the sun. The world I live, you're not a father until you have a child. In the world God lives, God makes Abraham a father so he can have a child. The world I live, you're not righteous if you don't do right things. The world God lives, you have to be righteous so you can do right things. God's world is upside, excuse me, right side up. God's world is right side up. See, what we say, God, change everybody. Change my husband, change my children, change my boss, change my world, change my pastor, change my weather, change everybody. And then I'm going to change my mind. And God says, that's not the way I work. I first bring the light and then I bring the sun. I want my light to come from me. I don't want it to come from your circumstances. I want my peace and my joy not to come from your job, your spouse. I want it to come from me. And because of that, you get the light. You get the sun you get the moon you get the stars some of you have been asking God on day one to give you the moon the stars and the sun change my health change my circumstances change my dog my cat my husband and God says I want to bring the light outside of the sun the light outside of the stars the light outside of the moon I want to be your light I want to be your joy inside of your mind renewing you and then when you no longer need the sun, I'll bring you the sun on a day four. I'll bring you the stars on a day five. I'll bring you the blessing on a day six. I'll bring you the breakthrough on a day ten. And you will say, I'm no longer needing that. But God says, that's why I'm giving it to you. Come on, somebody. Right side up. That's your neighbor say, right side up. Number six. Excuse me, number five. Stop believing you can't control your thoughts. Write this down. You have thoughts. You are not your thoughts. You are doing the thinking that thinking shouldn't be doing you. The biggest lie we believe is the mind thinks whatever it wants to. Your mind is like a child, it needs to be trained. It could be spoiled brat child, loud child, yelling child, but it is your child and you need to train it. That's why the Bible says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good reported, there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, I want you to watch this. Meditate. You choose your thoughts. You meditate, meaning you think about that. Proverbs 23, 7, for as man thinks in his heart, so is he. Number six, take every thought captive like a prisoner of war. Remember we read in the beginning, the Bible says to take every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Write this down. Capture your thoughts before you can make them captive. What do I mean by capture? Become aware of your thoughts before you, capture, you, before you captivate them. Meaning, sometimes if you're battling with stronghold, Become aware of your thoughts. Wow. Especially the automatic ones. When something is about, about, about to happen, your heart begins to beat and the thought begins to say, it's going to be a negative report. He's going to reject me. I'm going to get, I'm going to get fired. I'm going to get, and so just, just become aware of that. And then you say, why is this coming out of my head? And then you take the thought, you put a dagger in the thought and you lead the thought like 
a captive with the sword in its back until it submits to the obedience of Jesus. So you can't, you can make them captive until you capture them. So you capture them, meaning you become aware. Sometimes when it's a negative proclivity, I, I've had this story um, one time, I remember, um, you know, we grew up in a, in a poor household, but we always had all of our needs met. And one of the things that my dad always told me is, in our family, you know, we, we never buy nice cars. We buy uh, good cars that could last, but never nice cars. As, I don't know if it's a lust of the flesh, pride of life, or uh, what it was. I wanted an Audi. Again, I'm submitting it to you that I was wrong, young, and ex anyway, <laughs> just wanted an Audi. And I remember I told my dad, I want an Audi. And, and my dad fixed Audis, and so he, he says, bad car. Uh, very expensive, insurance expensive, fixing is, is hard. And, and so and I was like, well, I still want it. And so my dad says, no, uh, Toyota and Honda are the only thing that's, that's, that's kind of last you, son, and easy to change oil and you don't deserve it. I was like, yeah, I agree. I don't deserve it, but I still want it. So I get this Audi. So I went and I uh, decided to break the generational curse. Um, just kidding. Uh, unnecessary generational curse. And then unserious uh, generational curse. I go buy this Audi. The only difference is that I bought a used car and the guy duped me, meaning he, he sold me a bad car. But my dad never went with me because my dad understands cars and he would have spotted that, but I didn't know how to spot bad things. He just <clears throat> had turbo, so I really liked it. So I come back home and then um, I come back home and one time I'm driving and I hit on brakes and the car doesn't brake, it accelerates on the red light. Almost killed me. Go to the store, they, they fix um, everything and I go to the, to the place, they fixed everything and I come back to my dad and I had another problem and my dad says, I told you. So part of me is, okay, dad is right. In my family, this is the way it's going to be for the rest of our life. Anything that you want that's nice, it will break. Why? Because it's just not part of what is allowed in our family. And, and I respectfully told my dad, I said, dad, I know that's how we lived all our life. But that's not how I want to live. And, and I'm not going to accept that as my future. And eventually... You know, I sold that car and, and got another nice car that I gave, I gave away. And, but I remember listening to that voice when the car broke down. Part of me, my dad's voice came out and says, uh, this won't work. It will fail. It will break. This is what happens when you don't stay with this lane that a family has been in. And see, and sometimes you experience that resistance. And part of you will say, yeah, I agree. I need to go back to how I used to be, like that girl with the seizure. I know what that's a seizure, so it's just part of life. Here I am, I thought I was going to be healed. <laughs> that was that, well, see where that landed you and stuff. Or the other part's like, no, I'm going to go into the new territory that God has for me. If I experience some resistance, I'm going to stay with it because I know this is what the Lord is leading me on and I'm not going to yield to the past and I'm not going to stay, stay with the old wineskins. And the Bible says, if you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. That's what God says. I know your dad might not have that precedent. His good of the land, I think it was Kenneth, uh, uh, Kenneth Hagen that says, he says, somebody's good of the land is Camry. Somebody's good of the land is Cadillac. Somebody's good of the land is private jet. And says, you don't have the right to judge somebody else's definition of the good of the land. If they're willing and obedient, and how God begins to meet their needs and provide for them and blesses them with their good of the land. Well, that's not your problem or their problem that their definition is different of the good of the land as somebody else's. If for my dad, the good of the land was to have a beautiful, nice Japanese car that was nice. My definition of the good of the land slightly upgraded and changed. <laughs> All right. God bless you, everybody. Amen. Take your thoughts captive. Don't be captive to your thoughts. Write this down. Train your thoughts. Don't trust them. Your thoughts are not to be trusted. Meaning, you don't lean on your understanding. Sometimes thoughts could be deceiving. Now we know God uses our thoughts to speak to us and lead us. But what we understand is the scripture teaches us we need to train our thoughts. The scripture teaches us that we need to choose those thoughts. We impose thoughts on our mind instead of constantly letting those thoughts be imposed on us. Number seven, don't empty your mind, fill it with the truth. 
but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Psalm 1-2 As you fill your conscious mind with scripture, it will spill into your subconscious mind. Whatever you feed your mind with becomes your mindset. While you cannot control your mindset at first, you can control what you feed your mind with, which will become your mindset. So the mindset is already the set thoughts that are thinking kind of on their own. And people come up sometimes and say, I'm going to change my mindset. Not right away. You cannot change your mindset if you don't change what your mind is filled with. So what you fill your mind with regularly spills into your mindset, into your subconscious. Your subconscious is what thinks automatically. It's what responds automatically. You don't go back right away and change this without changing what you fill your conscious mind with regularly. That's why the importance of reading the Word, memorizing the Word, being in the Bible study, being in the discipleship is important. Why? Because while your mindset is dictating one thing, what you're doing is you are dictating something else and you fill in your mind which will spill into your subconscious and then your mindset begins to change with time amen eastern meditation empties your mind christian meditation fills your mind eastern meditation is about detachment christian meditation is attachment to god eastern meditation is passive christian meditation is aggressive eastern meditation is demonic christian meditation is holy spirit filled and inspired there's a lot of focus right now. If you have an app on your phone, most likely you will say breathe. And sometimes I look at that, I was like, what do you think I was doing for the last 20, 37 years? I was breathing. Meditate. The meditation is a very famous topic today. And some people are afraid of that who came out of new age. And the, the thought of meditation, like, whoa, new age red flag. Please understand, meditation is a biblical concept. The big difference between meditation in the Bible and meditation in Buddhism is this. Buddhism is passive detachment. Biblical meditation is aggressive warfare. It's warfare. You're not empty, you're filling. That's why the Bible doesn't say, empty your mind. It says meditate, meaning you force your mind to think on things. You take your thoughts captive. It is aggressive. It is not... No, 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 no. It's you filling your mind with the truth of God. And the Holy Ghost begins to touch that. You're not trying to detach. You're trying to attach yourself to the truth of God. You attach yourself to the Bible. You attach yourself to the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. Touch your neighbor and say, meditate on God's Word. Number eight. Confess what you believe, not what you feel. So most of this, what I've dealt with right now, is the truth, think about God's Word, fill you God's, God's Word and everything. Once it goes inside, then it has to come out. How do you break the stronghold? It's not only filling yourself with God's Word. You have to now speak. This doesn't mean you have to quote King James. It just means you speak thoughts from God's Word that are in line with God's Word. Joshua 1.8 says, do not let this book of the law depart your mouth, but meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, and then you will make your way successful. So sometimes you don't have to switch careers, you just have to switch your mind, and then your way you've been doing becomes successful. And then you will have good success. You will make your way prosperous, your way, meaning whatever that you've been doing, God says, I can bless that. You can be Joseph in, in jail, and God says, I'll bless that. You can be Joseph in prison, and God says, I'll bless that too. Why? Because as you meditate on my word, and God says, as it not departs from your mouth, meaning God's word begins to spill out of your mouth. Your speech is positive. Your speech is faith building. Instead of looking at every obstacle, saying, oh, we're going to die. To say, you know what? The Lord is good. He's got us. Everything is going to be all right. I trust in God. It is well with my soul. You might not feel that, but you think that and you speak that. I might not control my feelings, but if I control my thoughts and control my speech, my feelings will get in line. To renew your mind, stop being addicted to your feelings. The Bible does not say, do not conform to this world but change your mood. 
feelings they come up and go you cannot control them at times they're boisterous they're like oh they're just whoa, whoa, whoa. You, you can't control that and please understand that's why a lot of you listen to music too much because it makes you feel better you have developed this thing inside of you where you are a feeler instead of a believer and it's all about feeling better instead of thinking better your life doesn't change when you feel better there are drug addicts who feel better than you and their life is bad because it's not about how you feel, it's how you think. The renewing of the mind is not changing my feelings, it's changing my thoughts and changing my speech and my feelings get in line. I boss my feelings around and my thoughts is God's goal. My mind is God's goal and then God says, I want you to be careful what you speak. Well, most of us are careful, it's like, but, but my feelings. Put your feelings in the back seat, strap them with the seat belt, and say, sit down. David said to his soul, he spoke to his soul. Many of us live in our soul. David says, why are you disquieted within me, my soul? That means he looks down at his soul and speaks to it. Most of us live in our soul and we're like, oh, I don't know what's happening to me. Get out of your head. Get out of your own head. You are not your thoughts. You are a spirit and you can speak to your emotions. But to do that, you got to align your thoughts with God's word and begin to speak what is true, not what you feel. Let the book of the law not depart your mouth. Meaning I got to speak. When the devil came against Jesus and some people think there was a real devil that showed up. You know, and I don't think personally, I could be wrong, that it was like physical devil that showed up in the physical form because it wouldn't be temptation. Come on, let's, let's face it. If the devil will come to you, you won't be tempted. You'll be like, Fire. You won't be tempted. Literally, he, he loses. If he would do that, it's when he masquerades as your own thoughts. And you're like, and it sounds more like you. And that's why the Bible says he was tempted in all points as we are. When I'm tempted, the devil doesn't come as the devil. He comes as my thoughts. And that's what makes it confusing for me. That's what makes it a little bit seducing to me because it sounds kind of like me. So it could be perhaps that it was the fiery darts and the thoughts. It could be. I'm not saying this 100% true. I just know based on the way you're tempted and I'm tempted. But what I love is the fact that Jesus did not respond to the devil with thoughts. The biggest challenge that people have fighting thoughts is they fight them with thoughts. Never fight thoughts with thoughts. Fight thoughts with words. You abort them. You stop them. The moment you release something, the train of your thought goes... <laughs> But the moment you go in there like, oh. it's like you're playing a, a, a mental soccer match. Oh. You don't win a battle like that. Something happens when you speak up and you, not out loud maybe, under your breath, and you say, no, I reject that. And Jesus slammed. Then your thoughts quickly just realign. Speak. Amen. Is this helping anybody? Number nine. Expect God to show up, not the devil. Now, so this is not a speech now. This is expectation. Expect miracles. Now, you know, it takes really no energy or no more energy to expect God to show up as it is to expect the worst case scenario. So what I mean by this, expect God to show up, meaning this, do not train yourself to renew your mind, not to expect worst case scenario. Now, sometimes people are like, well, I want to be prepared. It's okay to be prepared. Don't expect the devil to show up in your future. That is definition of fear. Expect God to show up in the future. Your expectation is like in your car, you know, you have the, the gear change. It's to reverse and drive. It takes the same energy to put it to reverse as in to drive, but directions are very different. It takes the same faith to believe the devil will show up because you're not sure. 
as it takes for God to show up because you're also not fully sure of what's actually going to happen. It takes exactly the same of faith, but the direction of those faith will be very different. So train your thoughts, your mind, to anticipate God to show up in the future. Now, I don't know, it looks like there could be a bad report from the doctors, but I'm expecting a good report. Well, you're building our hopes up. And the problem with that is, the Bible says in Zechariah, that we're prisoners of hope. Even today, says the Lord, I will restore double to you. Uh, one man married his wife, and um, she had this thing where she expected a thief to come into the house. So first night she hits him, she says, the thief is in our house. He says, uh, I don't think so. She's like, you need to go check the house because we have a thief. So he goes in, checks the house everywhere. No thief. He comes back, says, honey, everything's okay. Go to sleep. No thief. Oh, thank you. The next night, the thief is in our house. He says, I don't think so. Hey, please go check. The thief is in our house. He says, okay. Goes in, checks the house. So it kept going for 30 years. He already was like just blindfold, like just go, go in and check it. Until 30 years later, he comes in and there's a barrel of a gun to his face. Open his eyes. And the thief was actually there now. So the thief took everything and the guy said, before you leave, you got to meet my wife. She's been expecting you for 30 years. It's a big day for us. What do you expect? Expectation is the breathing place of miracles. Expect God to show up. Expect, oh, but my child is getting worse. It doesn't have to change. Your expectation doesn't have to be connected to the circumstances. It's connected to God. God's faithfulness, God's goodness, God will show up. Faith in a simple form is that looking into my future, I don't know what the future holds. I trust God to make His appearance. When, how? I don't know, but I trust him to show up. I don't release my faith for the devil to show up. I don't want the devil to show up. I'm not expecting the devil to show up. I don't want to see the devil show up. But what if he shows up? I don't know, but I'm expecting God to show up. And lastly, and this is very practical, take care of your brain. Why? Your mind thinks your brain is what you think with. The relationship between the brain and the mind is like the relationship between a piano and pianist. I'm not a pianist. I'm the mind. This is your brain. Right now, this brain is not working. But if you turn it on, maybe it will work. Your brain is what you think with. Your mind is what does the thinking. Which means, if your brain is damaged, the thinking will be altered. It will be affected. That's one of the reasons why exercise, plant eating plant-based foods, whole grains, fish, healthy fats, as olive oil and less meat is helpful so all of your keys work properly. Because some of us cannot make good music, not because the fingers are broken, the keys are broken. And we're like, but I have liberty in Christ. Six burgers later. Yeah, but they're breaking your keys. I don't know why my thinking is struggling. Well, because you're feeding the instrument. You're breaking that instrument. When you're breaking that instrument, then all of your skills are really limited to how many keys work properly. Your food, what you eat, and I'm not talking about spiritual food right now. I'm talking about that food that we will eat afterwards. The food of the Word of God is different. That deals with our mind, the player. I'm talking about right now the keys, the brain. You need to feed your brain. That means that as a Christian, when you're eating junk food a lot of times, not only you're destroying God's temple or damaging God's temple, but what begins to happen, and then, you know, we charismatics, we love divine healing and hate divine health. Uh, 
Yeah, we hate it. Why I say we hate it? Because I see the kind of snacks that are in the lobby of every church. What shows up in our small groups? The kind of food we put, I know it's cheap, I know it's quick. And we're like, God, heal me while I'm going to go ahead and use a hammer and break this piano. God made the melody flow through me. And God looks from heaven. He's like, come on, really? I made you in my image and likeness. Where is the spirit of stupid in my image? It's not in my image, but it's in you. Why is it you have there? Yeah. We destroy. I, I just personally believe many of us die and we pay for our premature death every single day by the choice of foods that we eat. Listen. So I really want to encourage each and every one of you not only to build your mind, take care of your brain. Because your mind does the thinking. Your brain is what your mind thinks through. If that's not healthy and you can improve it by the kind of food that you eat and you can hurt it by the kind of food that you eat intentionally. I understand there are accidents, there are things that happen that generics that are uh, in genes, that, that, that are things. I'm not saying that every single case is responsible for our, for our bad eating habits, but I do understand as Christians that we have done a poor job of taking care of our temple. And I think that God wants to raise us not only to fast and pray, but to also to eat healthy and to exercise. Amen. I want you to rise to your feet. Did you receive something today? Amen. I know some of you made a decision to go on that keto diet in January. You stopped it on January 3rd. And uh, come on somebody, the Lord is bringing us back. <laughs> New year, new me. Amen. Amen. I want you to place your hand on your mind. We're going to pray right now that this becomes a place of victory, truth, God's presence. The strongholds that are demonic are being broken down, even as we're hearing the truth. I want you, you know, every baby, when, when it's born, it comes out head first. And when it doesn't come out head first, they call it a breach. And some of us had a breach. Something is broken here. There's a breach that took place. And God wants you, every situation, He wants you to come out head first. He wants your mind to come out first. So begin to pray with this. So Lord God, I choose your word to renew my mind. Lord, I ask you that every lie of the enemy, I reject that right now. I renounce that right now. I break every stronghold that is demonic. In the name of Jesus, I commit myself to studying your word. I commit myself to speaking the truth. I commit myself, Lord God, to applying myself to your biblical principles, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, I pull down every demonic stronghold right now. I break down every demonic lie in my life. In the name of Jesus, in the area of my health, in the area of my finances, in the area of my relationships, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name, I train myself to think faith thoughts. Lord God, not to live a life of fear, not to live a life of negativity, not to live a life of pessimism, not to live a life expecting the devil always to show up, but expecting you to show up, expecting good report from God, expecting the good things will happen to me. Not because I'm just an optimist, but because I'm a believer, Lord. I believe in you. You're a good God. And Lord, today we just renounce every negative expectation. We just renounce all the pessimistic speech, the pattern of speech that is not in line with the truth of Jesus Christ. Lord, cleanse our mouth. Lord, some of our mouth is just, just like a verbal diarrhea. We just have constant flow of negative, pessimistic, defeated words. We repent of that, God. Let our words be seasoned with salt. Let them have truth. Let them have God in them. Let them have faith in them, God. Let them have truth in them, Lord God. Let them have positive outlook, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I today choose your word to be my spiritual food. I choose the truth to be my spiritual food in Jesus' name. Now I want you to pray for your brain. 
And I want you to commit to God that to the best of your ability, don't make promises you're not going to keep. I say, Lord God, help me to eat healthy. Help me to exercise so that my brain is well taken care of. For those of you who do have some kind of a brain missing chemicals, I'm going to pray right now that God's going to bring healing. For those of you who maybe have had a brain attacks, like physical attacks on your brain, or some kind of a, you were born with some kind of a disorder, we're just going to pray for God to bring healing right now. Nothing is impossible to God. Brain is an organ like, like other organs and God can heal. Lord, right now in the name of Jesus Christ, we come against every every sickness in the brain. I come against right now every swollenness in the brain. I come against ex fluids in the brain. They're not supposed to be there. We come against every brain cancer in Jesus mighty name. I come against every disorder, PTSD, anxiety disorder, or any kind of other disorder that is in the brain right now, Lord God. We come against them right now. We speak healing in Jesus name. Every missing chemical. We ask you that you're a God of creation and God of restoration. May you bring healing right now in Jesus mighty name healing right now every schizophrenia manic disorder Lord we ask you that you will bring healing right now bipolar or OCD in the name of Jesus Christ whatever that my father hasn't planted Lord God right now we just come against that Lord we're in line with your word and your word says God that you took our sickness upon you Jesus by your stripes we were healed and so I speak healing right now that fog in the brain that constant confusion that is just there because of maybe brain problems or spiritual problems in Jesus name whatever it is right now we speak life to it we speak breakthrough to it God that in every organ of our body including our brain that we will see the light of God we will see the truth of God we will see the presence of the Holy Spirit in Jesus mighty name in Jesus mighty name thank you Holy Spirit thank you Lord we love you Jesus you can put your hand down but now I want to ask any anybody in this room that maybe you came here today and you're battling with the sickness. I know we pray for for sickness yesterday. I'm just gonna. I have about a few minutes that I wanted to pray. If you are here and you're saying, "Hey, I'm believing for some. I'm believing for healing." I want you to just raise your hand. Just just right there where you are. Keep your hand up. If you see somebody with a hand next to you, um, I want you to come up to them right now. I want you to come up to them and I want you to ask them their name. So come up. Each person with a hand. Uh, somebody come up to them right now. It's all around the sanctuary. If you're a believer, now if you're not a believer, don't come up yet. <laughs> but if you're a believer, just come up. And if it's a person next to there, there are people, there are two people over there. One for each person. Ask their name. Secondly, I want you to ask them, what is the pain that they have? Or what is the sickness that they have? Just ask them. There's some people over there. Thank you. Thank you. If somebody comes up to you, you can put your hand down. Secondly, ask them, what is the pain or the sickness that they have? Okay. With their permission, if it's a men and men, women and women, I want you to ask if you can put your hand there. If it's the opposite sex, do not put your hand on their different body parts. You can just put their hand on their head. And right now, just for the next 60 seconds, I want you to command that sickness to go. Command that pain to leave. Come on, go. Just command that pain to go. There's, there's two people over there. Somebody come up to them. Uh -huh. just, just pray for them. Command that sickness to leave. If there's something in their joints, just, just command those joints to be healed right now. In the name of Jesus. Take authority over that in Jesus' mighty name. By the fire of the Holy Ghost, the blood of Jesus, be healed right now. Son of David, have mercy on them right now. Let your mercy and your favor speak for them right now. In Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be restored to the original position that Jesus intended for you to be in right now. In Jesus' name, strengthen your joints, strength right now in every organ, whatever that is broken, be healed in Jesus' mighty name. Spasms, nerves that were broken or there were an intention, be healed right now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You can stop praying right now. And so and I want you to ask him, ask him right now. Sometimes there's no way to see anything until a few days later. But I want you to ask him, say, hey, if, if they had that pain, ask them to look for it. Maybe they couldn't do something without that pain. Ask them to do something without that pain. Well, if you prayed and and there was a relief or there was a release and the pain is gone, I want you to just, uh, the whole group, just wave your hands so we can give God the glory. Are you, are you healed? Amen. Praise God. Amen.